You're listening to Innovators, the podcast from Harris Search Associates, where we speak with global leaders in education, research, engineering, and the health sciences, and ask them to share lessons learned as they continue to advance the frontiers of innovation and discovery. Today's podcast will be led by Rick Skinner, Senior Consultant. Not since the early days of computer science emergence as a separate field and academic discipline has there been so rapid and so pervasive an establishment of a new enterprise as that of data science. Part of the reason of this for this is likely because data science had its roots in computer science, albeit there are those in business analytics who can also make persuasive claims to parentage. Both the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth and the University of California at Irvine launched degree programs in data science in 2015, barely seven years ago. Soon thereafter, undergraduate and or graduate degree programs in data science were established at large research universities, such as the University of Michigan, and small liberal arts institutions, such as Davidson College. New schools, colleges, centers, and institutes have been founded at numerous universities, including ones such as the School of Data Science at the University of Virginia, established with a private donor gift of $120 million. The University of Rochester's Gergen Institute for Data Science, the eScience Institute at the University of Washington, and the Center for Data Science at NYU. These new organizations encompass a remarkable array of methods and tools that fall under the rubric of data science. But whereas early on, computer science was more often than not housed in departments of mathematics or in schools of engineering, data science appears to have been born of parents from across the academic spectrum including business, the health sciences, and the liberal arts. Indeed, the faculties in data science programs are drawn from a virtual plethora of disciplines, and as our guest today can attest, not just an entire institution, but several ones acting in concert. And then there's Wesleyan University. Wesleyan offers no degree in data science, choosing to cite Quantitative Analysis Center as providing quantitative education and research support for students and faculty across the curriculum. This reflects the premise of the center that, and here I quote, data science is an integral component of virtually every academic, business, public sector, and political endeavor in today's world. Data science thus seems to have significant momentum. So we thought it best to ask someone who is a national leader in the field about a project she is leading that is rather unusual. Talitha Washington is director of the Atlanta University Center AUC Data Science Initiative, a post she has held since August 2020. She is a professor of mathematics at Clark Atlanta University and an affiliate faculty member at Morehouse College, Morehouse School of Medicine, and Spelman College, her her alma mater. She was just selected president of the Association for Women in Mathematics. Before joining the AUC, Dr. Washington was an associate professor of mathematics at Howard University, where she was recognized with the Outstanding Faculty Award of 2019. On leave from Howard to the National Science Foundation, she received the NSF Director's Award for Superior Accomplishment in 2020 for exceptional stewardship in establishing the first NSF Hispanic Serving Institution Program, a congressionally mandated initiative. In 2021, she was elected to that year's class of fellows of the American Mathematical Society and the Association of Women in Mathematics. She's a graduate of Spelman College and earned her PhD from the University of Connecticut, then completed a research postdoctorate at Duke University. Members of the Atlanta University Center Consortium are Clark Atlanta, Morehouse College, Morehouse School of Medicine, and Spelman College. And the consortium is the oldest and largest association of historically black colleges and universities. It acts on behalf of member institutions and is the vehicle that attracted private support to launch the consortium's data science initiative. Welcome to Innovators. You know, I've been in higher education for a while, and most of the time I was always struck by the competition of, among universities and colleges whether it's on an athletic field or for faculty or for staff or money, whatever. So it's it's unusual to see a kind of active collaboration. And I know the consortium, the Atlanta University Center Consortium, has been around for a while. And so this probably worked out a lot of the kinks that might make collaboration a little harder. Still, to undertake something that involves not simply 
working across disciplines and colleges and schools, but across multiple institutions, that's something of an oddity, quite honestly, especially in something as broad and as diverse as data science. So I have to begin by simply asking, the, how did this data initiative come about? I know you weren't there when it was originally designed, but how did it come about? How did the four institutions work together and how did they decide on data science? So as you noted, uh, we enjoy a relationship here in Atlanta with the Atlanta University Center Consortium, which was established on April 1st, 1929. Wait, isn't April 1st, April Fool's Day? April Fool's Day. Yeah. No, no just a coincidence, just a coincidence. No statistical correlation, however. <laughs> That's when our, our consortium was born, 93 years ago. And it's a consortium enjoyed uh, between Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse College, Morehouse School of Medicine, and Spelman College to co-develop, to synergize, to do things at, at a larger scale in a way that makes sense for the four institutions. The four institutions are co-located near downtown Atlanta, Georgia, uh, when I say co-located, we're, we're separated either by a street or a sidewalk. And each institution is their own institution with their own mission, their own programs, their own goals. We share a common goal of educational excellence and providing those opportunities for our students and fostering an environment for our faculty where they can create innovations and in research to solve important problems. So, so there is a commonality there among these individual institutions. The presidents of Clark Atlanta, Spelman, Morehouse School of Medicine, and Morehouse College came together and acknowledged that th we need more diversity in the data science and analytics fields. If we think about healthcare, a lot of healthcare technologies are being built off of data sets which means that if a person like me, who's African-American female, gets a healthcare treatment, and that treatment was built on technologies where my demographic group wasn't represented in the data set, well, that could be bad news for me. <laughs> it may not be as effective for me. So there is a, a mission there, uh, not only to bring our students to data science at, at, a, at a bigger level, but really to solve this diversity problem, or a challenge rather in, in the data science analytics field to have more representation. So right now in the workforce, about 3% of data science analytics professionals are African-Americans and we're- Only 3%, only 3%? Yeah, it was um, a study by Harnham and they say mm -hmm. African, quote, African-American individuals account for 12% of the U.S. as a whole, but only 3% of data and analytics professionals, end quote. But going from 3 to 12, that's, that's a severe underrepresentation. And we know that we need diverse perspectives to inform the development of technologies, to inform the analysis, the collection, the analysis, and the interpretation of data that impacts not only how we receive healthcare, but what sort of policies are being built at the local, state, and federal levels. And it also informs who is going to be um, identified or misidentified as far as criminals and, and, and policing systems. So, I mean, these have real impacts and we need these diverse perspectives to ensure that biases, to ensure that racial bias um, doesn't enter these data technologies and algorithms and cause harm, but are these technologies and algorithms actually help people and really are a positive for society. So the cause was at least well-defined from the outset. What's the scope of this initiative? In the long run, what do you hope to accomplish? Well, the scope by the AUC presidents mm -hmm. was to be bold, <laughs> think big, and, and, and go for it. If I presented something to them, it wasn't bold enough, I, they would let me know it. It was great, you know, so it's a great relationship. They, it's, it's a wonderful group of presidents who are really, have great foresight and, and really have a, a grounding and an understanding about what, what needs to be done and how we could do this. So from them, 
we were charged to have a bold transformative, both education and research agenda in data science that has a major impact here in Atlanta. And I think it's maybe I was on the job for a day. They were like, okay, figure out how to do this thing of data science across four institutions. And now we want this data science initiative to be a resource for other HBCUs as well. So hurry up and figure this out and get this going because this is where this is, this is where we want you to, to, to bring this to all a, a, a modest goal, a modest goal. A modest goal. You know, scaling from about four HBCUs to about 101 plus, mm -hmm. you know, HBCUs mm -hmm. across the nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I said, sure, why not? And I was like, wait, how am I supposed to do that? Had and you unpacked your bags? Had you unpacked your bags at this point? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. At that point, I had just finished. I was a professor of mathematics at Howard University, mm -hmm. and I just finished a rotation, a three-year rotation at the National the Science South. Foundation. Right. My last day at the National Science Foundation, the day later, I was at the Atlanta University Center, and um, I did many trips driving back and forth on I-95 between Washington, D.C. and Atlanta. Ooh, to, and, and I moved myself here one car ride at a time. It was hectic. It was fun. It was ambitious. It was crazy. It was naive. And I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> now, but, but again, I want to make sure I understand. We're talking about every student at each of the four institutions developing proficiency, at a minimum proficiency, in data science. Is, has that ever been done in a similar fashion by multiple institutions? No, I don't think it had ever been done. Actually, many years ago, uh, many moons, before I went to the National Science Foundation, I, as, as a younger uh, faculty member, I was charged, it, it just literally charged, you know, think about electrons charging me about data science. And I went to, it was in Utah, the Park City Math Institute. It was a three week um, program where we came together and talked about data science and what should students learn and what should they do? And we ended up with a publication um, on the curriculum guidelines, which is, mm -hmm. it's a, well, even though I'm a co-author, it's still a nice publication <laughs> uh, talking about what, what should students learn at the undergraduate level in data science. And I remember after that workshop, I came back to Howard and said, you know, we have this writing across the curriculum we should have data across the curriculum. And to, for me, it was a no brainer. <laughs> and everyone else looked at you as if you were insane. Correct. Mm -hmm. You were like, what are you talking about? I'm like, data impacts every discipline, every major, every field. Um, if you think about English and text analytics, if you think about marketing data analytics to make sure that people buy your stuff, if you think about chemistry, when you're talking about uh, collecting data of atmospheric particles to, to make decisions. I mean, you, you pick the major, whether it's in, in fine arts or liberal arts or STEM, or whatever, you're, you're going to find some sort of data uh, component or data driven component. So for me, that it just made sense. Yeah, they looked at me like I was crazy. So here I am, um, you know, I guess it was five years later, <laughs> I, I, I had the opportunity to kind of build what's been germinating in my head as, as the no-brainer thing we should be doing. We have reading, we have writing, we have arithmetic, and we need to add data. I'm not sure how that starts with R, but... You'll work on that. You'll yeah. work on that. <laughs> Just, what do you anticipate to be near-term outcomes? And what are you looking, given the fact that you have presidents who want to be bold, what are you seeing for the horizon in terms of outcomes? Well, the way that we're looking and thinking about providing opportunities in data science for our students is yes, in the classroom. So we partnered with AI for All in providing experiences for students to engage in artificial intelligence projects and, and learn proficiencies there. And that's led by uh, Professor Yvonne Phillips at Morehouse College. Mm -hmm. So we really enjoyed that. So we do have courses. We also have a data in the African diaspora course, which introduces students to data science thinking with a focus on data sets that impact those of the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. So we do have mm -hmm. courses and we also have an active data science club. It's an AUC data science club that brings in industry professionals to talk about what does a data scientist do? And they also have um, data science professionals come in and do workshops with them 
under different topics. We host trainings for our students and we have like a digital badging system that we give um, for the students. We also in the summertime provide a slate of workshops for our faculty, staff and graduate students anywhere for, for R for genomics to looking at reproducible reproducible research in the social sciences Mm -hmm. to collaborating with prosecutors' offices and and providing data-driven solutions with your local prosecutor. Our workshops really transcend all of these different topics. Python's in there. That was like a really um, high-demand class this summer, stopped by Professor Erdi Kara at Spelman College. And so there's, we we have over 200, 230 faculty, um, staff, and graduate students participating in these workshops. And now we're seeing that the faculty are coming back and they're able to put in their research. They're able to put in their teaching. Uh, for example, I had a professor, he's a Spanish professor. And he, he said, I, can I get a letter of support? I took your, you all's Python workshop. I got hooked. Now I'm doing just mapping and it's working. It's helping me with my research. And he's a Spanish professor. Then, you know, I said, hey, I was a Spanish minor. Let's talk Spanish, but, you know. Play to your strengths. When you said bold, you're bold. Very bold. Secondly, it's not a classroom alone process. Right. It's fairly pervasive throughout a student's experience at any one of these four institutions. Now, I just want to remind not only myself, but those who are listening to this, you're talking about a medical school involved yeah. with this. And so all of the medical students involved. I guess you probably know that there's an old adage that's been around for a thousand years that says, in order to have respect for sausage and politics, you can't know how they are made. I got. I have to ask you at this point, in order to do what you're doing, I, I'm not sure you really want to know how it's done. So I guess what I'm really curious about is how did you engage the faculty? Because mm-hmm. it's clear from what you just described, the faculty are being expected to, regardless of discipline, field, whatever, they're being asked to take on sizable portion of the responsibility yeah. for delivering instruction and whatever in data science. How 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 did you do that? Uh, I, I'm trying to imagine the the response of someone in the English department or someone in physics saying, "Do you want me to do what? Right. How did you do that?" Or the Spanish professor calling me saying, "I did your provo, your uh, your Python, and now I'm using it in my research." I did your Python training. So yeah, so it's a, so when I first came to your point, I, I first came August of, of 2020 and people were like, students, students, students. I said, that's nice. I am going to work with faculty first. <laughs> and okay, people thought it was weird. Well, people still think I'm weird. That's another story for another day. We'll talk about that. Yeah, but if we think about, um, this, this may be a bad analogy, but like it, for an airplane, when you're on there, they always say that, Put the, you know, if something bad happens or if you're in, in danger, put the mask on yourself first and then somebody who's younger or the child. Now, I'm not saying students are children, but my thing I is if thinking about institutional sustainability. We have to provide the resources, the lend expertise support to our faculty because they will stay around with us. And by helping one faculty member, we can reach way more students through that one faculty member. Mm-hmm. And they will mm-hmm. amplify our efforts. So I said, fa- faculty first. So I really didn't touch students until uh, maybe into the second semester. It was all, how can we um, get the faculty and how can we support them? Were so, there incentives for them to do this? Yes. So our faculty, and this is typical of HBCUs, they, there's a, a significant teaching load. And so they're, you know, it's, we compete with our best resource, which is time. Right. And we find that it doesn't take a huge incentive. Sometimes it can take a, a tasty lunch that it could, that could provide incentives uh, <laughs> in, enough. Right. And then some faculty, they're just like, I just want to do this. And I want to do this with people across the AUC with, with different institutions, because mm-hmm. I know what I know. But when I am in the room with people fr- from different institutions with different perspectives, I can bring this to my institution and, and develop programming in ways that couldn't happen otherwise. That led you to an interesting question. The, the very fact that your four institutions, I know Atlanta and I know the center fairly well, the fact that your four institutions are so geographically proximate, 
they're already in relationships, I'm sure, among faculty that go back years in some cases. How important was that proximity to being able to facilitate creating a kind of a critical mass of faculty? Not important. Why? It wasn't. Uh, I remember there's a professor at Clark Atlanta. I, I, I cannot recall his name. He called, he just called me. I, I get random calls every now and then. And, and I do answer my phones. I, I'm, I'm just weird. He calls me, he says, you know, before you came, the faculty in the AUC, we didn't do much together as a faculty. Like, let's all get together and, and work together to do something, right? He said, but you've come and you kind of define that. And also at the same time, I'm a product of the Atlanta University Center. I graduated from Spelman. I enjoyed having, you know, I had a Morehouse brother. We would go to the Morris Brown games, hang out at Clark Atlanta on, on the wall, so to speak, on Friday afternoons. So as a student, for me, the Atlanta University Center was my playground. It was a natural thing for us as students to be together. Uh, and so I kind of brought that same passion for faculty where everything that we do, we want representation from across the AUC. So I have a, I, I have a faculty advisory board made up of faculty and staff from across the AUC. We have working groups that we do in, incentivize, uh, modest incentivizing to help us do work, mm -hmm. basically, right? To build a data science capacity. And the working groups are always made up of a representation from across the Elaine University Center. And so having folks come in and make the connection with somebody who lives across the street. However, we're on Zoom. That's why I said that across the street doesn't matter because we can meet on Zoom. We can yes. meet on Teams or, or what have you. And so it's, it's not the physical proximity, I think that makes the, the difference in how do you get folks to collaborate across these um, silos, right? Institutional or departmental silos is what is our common goal? What is our common mission? And that we agree this is how we will do this. So a lot of our, how we get things done, we give that uh, to our faculty to work with us to co-develop the how, to, to co-develop how should we do this thing of data science, to really inform us, like, what should I do? So I, I tell people, you know, everybody tells me what to do and it's great. I have a 23 member <clears throat> faculty advisory board, I report day to day to an executive director of the AUC consortium. I have direct lines to all four provosts, director of the library, and dotted lines to all four presidents. I mean, hey, how can I go wrong with all that? Uh, <laughs> just, just tripping over one's shoelaces, probably, but that's another matter. We've talked about something implicitly. I guess I need to ask you. You had to have some money to do this. Where did the money come from? Well, the money grows on trees. <laughs> Okay. For you, it may, but for not most no. people. No, 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 not, not at all. So it does take resources to get this done, right? It does take resources to do things in a different way and to incentivize folks and give people the time and the space mm -hmm. to actually engage in doing uh, data science research mm -hmm. and data science teaching and training. So we were funded in 2019 uh, by United Health, and they were they believed in Lane University Center. They believed that we could make this monumental impact in, in data science across the AUC. And they've been great partners with us ever since. So they funded us at 8.25 million in 2019 to really stand this up and have a vested interest in, in what we're doing. Yep. Well, that, that was our, our kickstart. Yep. I've neglected to mention it, that you did all of this during COVID. Yeah. So I'll, I'll come back to that perhaps in a moment, but let, let me go on a minute. I, I know you're a, a data scientist yourself, so I have a feeling that you must have gone out and taken a look, and you've already referenced some, like writing across the curriculum, other projects of somewhat similar scope, not exactly this one. It, you must know that if you go back and look at those projects, and I was involved in a lot of those too, their results are usually modest. They're modest in most cases. What in the good name of science led you to think that this one will work? So I'm, I'm a, by training, I'm a mathematician, applied mathematician. Mm -hmm. I do uh, dynamical systems, differential equations, yes. artful and ordinary. And I, I like to use that as my microscope to figure things out. So you can say that I do systems thinking. I like to um, think about different entities 
and think about, let's say from a chemist perspective, reaction rates of what impacts what, and how are these things interconnected in this network and how are things influenced and how can things be amplified or, or de-amplified in, in ways that make sense for the whole system. So I really think about the uh, four institutions with all the different um, stakeholders involved um, through a systems lens, through, through a um, applied mathematicians lens. Mm -hmm. If, if that makes sense in any way. Mm -hmm. I think the first time I thought about how do you build institutional capacity to enhance, let's say, education or STEM education for students was in standing up the Hispanic Serving Institutions Program at the National Science Foundation. I believe you started that, pro you actually established that project. Yeah, and it was a congressionally mandated, I'm not speaking on behalf of the foundation at all. This is, you know, I understand. disclaimer. Yeah, I have to say that disclaimer. But it was a congressionally mandate to work across all HSIs to build STEM capacity. Well, HSIs, you have community colleges, you have regional schools, you have uh, research intensive, you have the, the big R1s that, that get a lot of research dollars. So how do you create a, a program that's equitable across all institutions and achieves the goal of building educational environments where all students can thrive? And in particular, Hispanic students and other underrepresented students. So I think that was my first time really thinking about doing that at a national level. And at that time, mm -hmm. there were about 532 HSIs, you know, with a little bit less than half being community colleges. And so I, that in developing and crafting that program, because here we have four different institutions, mm -hmm. one's all female uh, undergraduate only, all male undergraduate only, co-ed. Research two, Carnegie classification, so research intensive, mm -hmm. and then medical school graduate only. So all these four institutions have different institutional classifications mm -hmm. and they have different missions. And at the same time, we've enjoyed being able to co-develop programming across these institutions that we're now going to leverage and launch at a national scale to work across all HBCUs by establishing um, the National Data Science Alliance. I want to talk about that now, if you don't mind. Uh, let me leave that point, though. You had enough experience in your mind that you thought this was doable in the sense that you had four institutions and that you had four institutions whose leadership was pretty strongly committed to this, and you had some resources. So that's at least there. Now, you've been very fortunate. In less than two years, you've been able to attract I believe it's an NSF grant of $10 million. Mm -hmm. And you're now going to take what you're doing among four institutions. And if I understand it correctly, you're now going to build that out to every HBCU institution in the country around data science. That's the idea. And you said that I thought that coming here, I thought the job was doable. I'm not sure I did. Actually, a friend of mine, I, I talked to a friend of mine before taking the job. I was like, why should I do this? This is crazy. Who works at the intersection of four institutions? Like, can you really please everyone? Like, how do you? And he's like, look, you're, you're the crazy enough, you're crazy <laughs> enough to actually go and do it. So just do it. And, and let's talk about, you know, what, what's on the latest trend on Facebook. I'm like, okay. They also ask if you'd had a rabies shot, probably at that I point. Don't know. So. Yeah. Maybe, but it's, I'm not sure if I exactly knew it was doable. Uh, all I knew is that the the call, the vision, the goals of the Data Science Initiative here from the Atlanta presidents was noble and and needed. And and I figure, you know, why not? Let's give it a shot and go for it. Yeah, it doesn't translate into into doable. And and you, you said we we attracted an NSF grant. We've actually been working on that. Since I came, so I'm not sure. Maybe there's an attractive feature in, in hard work, and if so, that that's what we do in Atlanta. Well, I I think the point your point's well taken. That if you're going to aspire to what you're talking about, it's going to take resources, and and I think what you were able to do with what's as you pointed out, the National Data Science Alliance. First of all, it aligns so well with what NSF is looking to do and accomplish. Secondly, it builds clearly on your work with the Hispanic serving institutions and the like. The scale of this, though, is just extraordinary. I, I'm thinking about all the HBCU institutions I've been to around this country. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't know, there's so much variety. Are the institutions going to be asked, invited, or is there going to be some process by which they come in? How many institutions would you like to have involved? Um, well, the last question is the easiest one. I know it would be for you. All of them. All like, of them. I'm not sure how that's. <laughs> that's not even a question. <laughs> I'm not sure how that's a question. It's all of it. So since I've been here, so I get random calls from various HBCUs from across the country saying, look, how are y'all doing this? And I happily share, you know, what we're doing. What, what we're doing does not need to be behind some veil and I, I don't own it. it it's co-developed and I'm happy um, mm. to give out and share whatever the secret sauce is. But if you have me cook in a kitchen, forget about it because I'm not a good cook. <laughs> but if it's a secret sauce of data science or, or, or as you called it, um, making the sausage and the sausage is built off of zero and one, you know, binary numbers. Sure, I can do that part. You're doing that. You're going to take that on. But it, but it really is. So we will have like an NDSA uh, membership, but we'll have an institutional uh, membership. We'll also mm-hmm. have partners from either individuals, nonprofit industry or other higher education institutions. And then we'll also have like an affiliates who are just like individuals, or other people who support the, uh, the vision of the National Data Science Alliance. So we will have formal, we're building, developing formal structures to have like an official membership with the National Data Science Alliance. But a key component of it really is this collective impact. It's being able to hear from the community to co-develop with us at a national level, what should this National Data Science Alliance do and be to meet a variety of institutions where they at and to provide that support and sense of community among uh, the faculty, among the administrators and, and, and so that we can develop these ecosystems where their students can thrive in data science. And it also strikes me that there's a continuity to it, obviously, from the very first aspirations you had with the initiative that is to reach out and, and provide students with skills that they'll need, regardless of major, regardless of profession and the like. So there is that continuity. Is it going to work? I don't see why not. <laughs> Dr. Washington, it, it's been a long time since I've talked to someone who, if I ask them, can they fly? They say, how high? It's been a while since I've talked to someone like that. We're going to check back with you in maybe a couple of months, maybe a year or two. We hope that you'll still be in one piece. This sounds like an extraordinary initiative. And I must say, what strikes me more than anything else, at a time that we're being told in so many ways to think small and just do things gradually and so forth, it's, it's really quite refreshing to hear something and someone talking about taking on a big, big project with really, it may sound corny, but with very noble goals. Thank you for joining us today on Innovators. Thank you for listening to Innovators, a production of Harris Search Associates. We'll have more insightful conversations with global thought leaders to follow.